Good morning, Scouts, Auxiliarists, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lieutenant John DeCastro. I am a helicopter pilot here at Air Station in Atlantic City, and on behalf of our commanding officer, I'd like to welcome you to this virtual tour. Here at Air Station in Atlantic City, we have, or we fly the MH-65 Delta, a short-range search and rescue helicopter. Our primary missions are search and rescue and aerial intercept, where we interface with the Air Force. For our search and rescue, our area of responsibility spans from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, all the way down to Elizabeth City, North Carolina. <clears throat> and here at the unit, we have over 250 personnel, 60 of which are officers, the rest of them are enlisted, where we maintain and operate up to 11 aircraft at one time. All right, so here we are in our duty hallway, 365 days a year, for 24 hours a day, we have a SAR ready crew ready to respond within 30 minutes. And that, with that being said, we have two pilots, a rescue swimmer and a flight mech who are here ready to stand duty or ready to launch at any given point. In addition to, we also have up to three or more ground crew to include watch captain and line crewmen to help us get the planes ready to do the maintenance on our ready crews. These people, we have our duty rooms where we sleep at night, and most of the times that we get called tend to be at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Unfortunately, very rarely do people actually need our help when it's a beautiful day outside, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Most of our times either comes in bad weather, inclement weather, storms, low ceilings, freezing, snow, or when it's in the middle of the night. So <clears throat> we do sleep, however, we do have also have a SAR alarm, which will go off and wake us up. And then we each have a telephone in each individual room to call specific people when needed. Now with all these people on duty, our primary goal is to be ready to fly. We still have ground jobs, we still have training flights, but when we are on duty, our primary mission is to be rested and ready to respond. So oftentimes we will be either relaxing in our duty rooms or we also have cruise lounges and ward rooms where, where we are walking to now. These are areas of, think of a living room or a den. We have televisions, video games, couches, recliners, cooking utensils, ovens, microwaves, toaster ovens, that sort of thing. This is essentially our second home when we are on duty. And as we are walking into the wardroom now, our typical duty section, our duty watches, where we will stand seven to nine 24 hour shifts a month. And during that time, this is where we will be relaxing, ready to respond. Because once again, in a moment's notice, we could be called and we have to be airborne within 30 minutes to go anywhere from Cape Cod down to Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And <clears throat> we could be flying up to eight hours a day, depending upon how we do our crew duty and our flight planning well, which is a long time in an aircraft, particularly when you are up all day and you launch at 10 o'clock at night. Now, not only are you up all day, you're flying throughout the evening. So that's why it is very important to remain rested when we're on duty. Where we are now is we're about to walk into our operations center. The operations center is, for lack of a better term, the brain of everything we do here. All incoming calls for cases come into the operations center. The operations center then passes that information to the crews and monitors that while we are out flying. So if you will, follow me as we walk into the operations center. We also have a operations duty officer who sleeps in this bunk room right here. He is responsible for fielding all phone calls that come in from District 5 Command Center and then processing those calls and waking up all the crew. And in the operations center, there is a multitude of equipment at the operation duty officer's disposal. In addition to a lot of charts that we have on the wall, which are used for reference, we also have multiple TV monitors, which we have hooked up to computers as well as we have both a standard workstation where we can offer or access our Coast Guard specific intro web applications. We also have a AMOS system which is operated by the Air Force. And we 
have multiple phones, as you heard, that just rang. And in addition to all of these things, we also have three radios. We have a uniform radio, which is used, or which we use to talk to aircraft while they're up. And then we also have two VHF radios, which we have monitoring a Coast Guard specific frequency, as well as channel 16 and or 83 alpha, depending upon what our operation needs. From this point here, we also have access to our SAR alarm, which if you bear with me one moment, I will make a demonstration of that. Now, the following is a test of the SAR alarm. All hands, disregard, disregard. Now, the following is a test of the SAR alarm. Just making a pipe so no one actually thinks this is a real case. So that is what will ring in the middle of the night, and that is another pipe to let everyone know that any other time we hit that alarm, it's an actual case. That alarm is what indicates to everyone at the unit that we have a SAR case. So our line crewmen are going to take the aircraft out, conduct a pre-flight on it, make sure it's gassed up. Meanwhile, the pilots are going to come up to the operations center, gather all the applicable information that we have, such as what type of case. Is it a person in the water? Is it a vessel taking on water? Is it a vessel on fire? And it could be also a medical emergency. We will figure out where that case is, do any necessary pre-flight planning which we need. During inclement weather, we have to do a lot more pre-flight planning to include filing an instrument plan, figuring out what alternate airports we need to go to, where our nearest hospitals are, our fuel planning to, fi fuel planning to figure out how much gas we can take, is that gas going to be enough to get 60 miles offshore, pick up four people, and drive 60 miles back into shore? Are we going to have to leave a rescue swimmer on scene, pick up two, go get gas, and come back? And that's all going to be dependent, changing every single different case, every single different day, based upon the weather, the weights of the crew. So there's a lot of pre-flight planning that goes into that. While the pilots are doing that, the rescue swimmer is going to be down in the shop getting dressed out, inspecting his gear, making sure it gets on the aircraft, and the flight mechanic is going to be helping the line crewmen go through the pre-flight process of the aircraft, checking the maintenance logs and making sure that the plane is actually capable of doing the mission in which we have been tasked. Here we are in the hangar bay of Air Station in Atlantic City. To my right, we have our heavy maintenance bay. We can have four helicopters in this bay at any given time, and these are in various states of maintenance. Typically, the far right, way down at the end, is our more heavy maintenance where we actually completely tear apart the helicopter. The one currently in there has no engines in it, no rotor system, no gearbox. The other two are either in a 30-day or a 7-day maintenance cycle where they do various types of maintenance on the helicopters from changing oils to inspecting different components, making sure that the helicopters remain in a safe flight status. On the other side of the hangar bay, we can have up to four to five additional helicopters, and these are typically the ones that are operational and can be flown at any moment. Currently, the one at the far end is our current ready helicopter for the day, which is the one in which we will take if we need the case, or if we have a case. And as I said earlier, the type of helicopter we fly is the MH-65 Delta. It is the Coast Guard short-range search and rescue helicopter. We typically cruise around at around 120 knots, and our fuel endurance is roughly two and a half hours with a full SAR crew. If we omit people or have less crew, we can take on more fuel and extend that range, but for typical, our typical search and rescue case, is about two to two and a half hours, which would make our range at 120 knots, roughly 240 nautical miles on one bag of gas. Now, if we have to go out and come back, that's going to reduce that effective working range to around 100 nautical miles, given on the environmentals. If we have a tailwind, we can go significantly further. If we have a headwind, it drastically cuts down on our range. So this helicopter behind us is one we're going to get an up-close tour with. 
One important thing or one distinguishing fact about the MiG-65 is the tail rotor right here. It does not have a traditional tail rotor like normal helicopters. It has a finistron where the legs act more as a fan as opposed to a traditional rotor head. And with that, it gives us different advantages and disadvantages, which is, once again, dependent upon the situation, can either greatly help us or will hinder us, depending upon what we are doing. Walking more towards the nose of the helicopter, you can see we have four rotor blades up at the top. This helicopter is a European helicopter, so the rotor blades spin opposite for most helicopters that are flown here in the States. And that's just a product of it being produced in France. The helicopter has two engines. Both engines can produce more torque than the gearbox can handle. So this helicopter is actually limited in power by the gearbox, not the engine, which is where a lot of our weight considerations come into play. When you're talking about power percentages of the engine, they can produce up to 130, 140% more torque than the gearbox can handle. And then moving, continuing on, this is our hoist hook, where the hoist cable will actually be lowered down by the flight mech with either a rescue basket or a rescue swimmer or some type of rescue device on it so that way we can affect the rescue in the water. Now, if you will come up, I'll show you inside the helicopter. This is the cabin where our flight mech is gonna sit in this chair right there and our rescue swimmer will be in the back along with all of our rescue equipment. So you can see that there's a rescue basket and some trail lines back there. And then we have more equipment shoved further in the back. And then I'm gonna climb in and we'll show you the actual cockpit. So this aircraft has two pilots. You have a pilot and a co-pilot. The pilot sits in the right seat, unlike a traditional airplane, and the co-pilot sits in the left seat. And it gets confusing because in addition to pilot and co-pilot, we also have aircraft commander and co-pilot, <clears throat> different from the seating position co-pilot. So the aircraft commander typically will sit in the left seat. That way they can have better situational awareness over the mission and affect and make more high order mission decisions such as fuel planning, mission planning, what hospital we're going to, etc. where the more junior guy will actually be manipulating the controls. In the controls, we have a cyclic, which is right here. This causes pitch up, pitch down, roll left, and roll right. Here we have a collective, which is for our power. And then we have pedals for our rudder, which controls our yaw or our nose alignment. In addition to, you can see up here, we have two sets of instruments. We have one set for the pilot and one for the co-pilot, completely identical. These include our airspeed, our rotor RPM, our attitude indicator. We have a multifunction display, which will display a numerous, or numerous things. We have a radar altimeter, a bar barometric altimeter, and then this right here is our TCAS, which is a traffic avoidance collision system. In the center, we have a, our fire indication system. So if we were to get a fire on one of our engines or our gearbox, we would have lights and indications right there, and then we'd have fire extinguishers. We have our warning, cautions, and alert panel, <clears throat> which will let us know if we have any type of emergency or just any type of whether or not our landing lights are on and just lets us know kind of what's going on with the aircraft. We then have a little bit of engine controls right here, our fuel controls. This displays engine data for us when we're in flight. We have our electrical controls here, and then these two things are our flight computers. They allow us to manipulate flight plans, data inside the aircraft, so we can do in-flight in planning and better maintain situational awareness. <clears throat> Moving further down, we have our communication panels, one for the pilot, one for the co-pilot. We also have a radar on board where we can do surface search, if we're looking for a specific vessel or a person in the water, we'll tilt it down and go to one of our surface search modes. <clears throat> in transit to a case, if the weather is bad, we also have a weather capability on this radar where it will be similar to a Doppler radar that you see on TV. 
not near as high tech and you don't get the fancy colors, but you can still pick out the most intense portions of storms so that way we can better navigate through and around thunderstorms. That concludes our tour of Air Station Atlantic City today. I greatly appreciate you viewing this video and I hope that you enjoyed the tour and thank you and have a wonderful day.